All right, guys, welcome to One on One with Alex Bellman. Today, I have a really great guest. I have the CEO of the Moore Center, Paul Boynton. And uh, today, we're just going to learn about him and all about the Moore Center and really uh, get into it. So how's it going, Paul? <laughs> it's great to be here. I appreciate you coming by. It's going to be cool. So, you know, when you were younger, right. did you know that this is what you were going to do? Uh, you know, like no. in high school, what was the plan? Um, I think if I, if I went back a little before high school, the plan was to either be in the circus or, or do something. Uh, really? Yeah, sort of performative, to be honest with you, which I never really had any real um, talent for, but that was, I think, the desire. That's cool. Um, and then um, as I got into high school, I began to recognize that I had to be more realistic. Um, and I've always had a sense of wanting to, um, I've always enjoyed people and enjoyed connecting with people. So I sort of gravitated towards social work and that was yep. the, um, that was my undergraduate degree, uh, at UNH. And before I graduated, um, I had gotten married and, uh, needed to find a job. So in my last semester, I was hired at Easter Sales as a social worker and finished my degree while I was working full time. Wow, really? Yeah, it, um, it, it happened kind of smoothly. Um, and, and out of desperation in a way, I don't think that was the plan to right. get a job before I graduated, but that's how it worked out. And then I had an incredible career at Easter Seals. I was there for 25 years and wow. got to do so many different things and learn so much uh, about how to uh, manage a nonprofit. And uh, it, was a, it was an extraordinary um, place to be for someone who was just starting out. And right. I just had so many opportunities and got to work with Bob Shillette, who was a, a great uh, CEO and w taught me about board development and fundraising and all the things that uh, made me feel like uh, I belonged in the not-for-profit world. And, and that's where I've stayed for my entire career. So after 25 years at, at Easter Seals, I transitioned to another almost 25 years at the Moore Center. That's amazing. Yeah. While you were at Easter Seals, because I know Easter Seals well, mm -hmm. um, was it in, not an easy place to move upward, but mm -hmm. because there's so few people, they really rely on their staff to right. quickly rise through the ranks. Um, what were some of your favorite positions that you held while you were there? I think the probably my favorite, first of all, I started as a social worker and, um, and then got to, engaged with uh, uh, off-site programs where we would sell uh, rehabilitation services to schools and hospitals, and so I managed that for a while. Then I became the director of an outpatient rehab facility, which oh, cool. they don't even really exist anymore the way they did when I did that, but that was one of my favorite jobs. And uh, I think one thing I learned by that a whole sort of being given so many opportunities that that feeling a sense of excitement about being where you work is a great um, sort of motivator for the people who are evaluating you. Uh, if they know that you're doing a good job, but that you uh, appreciate the opportunities that you're being given and that you feel positive about the work that you're doing, that sends a very strong message to people who are looking to promote people. And I think that's one of the reasons I, I was given so many opportunities because I really loved what I was doing and really showed up with a sense of enthusiasm and excitement about the work. That's great because I mean it is hard and I mean even from my experience from seeing people in my family work in that field it is hard to go in every day yep. and see so much sadness and um, you know difficulty and, and not be affected by right. it and not just that you don't like the job it's just that it's mentally draining Right, um, because you just want to help everybody. It really is true, and I think then you have to you you're put in a position where you have to sort of choose to to sort of where you're going to place your focus. And I've sort of always felt, and this sort of sort of led me into writing some of the the books that I've written is like, do you focus on all the power that you don't have, 
or do you focus on the power that you do have? And if you focus on the power you do have, it's like it's saying, I'm not going to pay attention to all the things I can't do. What I'm going to pay attention to are the things that I can do. Then there's a million things you can do in any situation. Right. And so that just changes your mindset. And then you're, you're not feeling discouraged as much because you're actually making things happen and doing things. So, that's really cool. I mean, that's yeah. that's exactly how I try to live my life, which is, you know, there's a lot of things I can't do, but the things I can do, right. I'm just going to give it 100%. Right. So focus on those. I, yeah. You know, it's like how powerful our thoughts are. There's a guy at the gym that I, I when I'm doing presentations, I always tell the story because I see him and I say, how you doing? And he goes, oh, Mondays suck. And I thought, wow, that's really, he's setting himself up to have really bad Mondays. And we went, I went back to the office and did the the math with a friend of mine. And if I, in in his lifetime, sucky Mondays added up to 10 years of his life. Oh, wow. It's like, so simply because he's telling himself that Mondays suck. So So if he would only say, Mondays are great, it's the beginning of a new week and I get to see what I can make happen today, he would have had 10 more productive years in his life. And he's a great guy, but um, that's just his mindset. Yeah, no, I think it's the one thing we, I try to, tell my staff a lot and you know when we when I tell my friends who and my my girlfriend is you know it positive po- sorry <laughs> positivity goes a really long way it really does. I mean just taking even a bad situation and just being like well that didn't work but we'll find something to do right, exactly. or we'll move past this yeah it my, makes everything better my favorite expression is now what because we're always <laughs> you know in challenging times and I don't think things are getting any easier for any of us and it's like if you if you say, ask yourself that question, now what? It begins to inspire you to, be, to become focused on, well, what can I do? There may not be a perfect answer or even a, a likely answer to the question, but if I'm going to do something, that's better than doing nothing most of the time. I agree. I think just getting up and, um, you know, sometimes, see, I always relate everything back to the gym because I do like it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'll have a friend call me and be like, you know, I, I didn't go today at six o'clock and I don't want to go. And I'm like, well, if you do go, why don't you go? And they're like, well, I have to go to bed soon. And mm-hmm. I go, what if you just go do 20 minutes and sit on the right. bike and watch a show? Right. And they'll call me after and be like, you know what? I did that. I feel way better. Right. It's true. Because you just did something. Right. Sometimes, it wasn't the best thing. Actually, but you did it. <laughs> to that point, sometimes just getting to the gym is better than skipping it. Right, because you yeah, went. Right, you at least got there. So You're getting that new habit formed. <laughs> yeah, true. You do that 20 times, now you have a habit, now it's really easy Absolutely. for your brain to switch into that mode. So with that in mind, I have to get back to the gym, but uh, it's a It's, it's a, a tough habit thing. when everything yeah. else is going on. It's true. Plus, you have a lot going on. So now you're, so when you first got to the Moore Center, were you immediately the CEO? Oh, I was. I was hired as the CEO. It's amazing. So it was. It was one of those sort of major career transitions in my life. Um, going, I was the vice president at Easter Seals, um, and I think probably most of the people listening to this uh, know Larry Gammon, who yeah. was my boss at the time. Uh, and it was. It was. He was another great person to learn from, and so I had this opportunity. I went to the Moore Center, and then I looked at myself and said, oh my goodness, you know, I'm not sure I know exactly what I'm doing here as a CEO. And so I, that's where the now what uh, really right. kicked in. And uh, I think, you know what, if you're going to grow, if you're going to do uh, things different than what you're doing today, then you have to take risks and you have to put yourself out a little bit. You have to put yourself into that. You have to stretch a little bit. You have to put yourself beyond what you know you can do in order to learn how to do something more. And I think that just comes from being positive. Yep, you know, I, I was talking to a, a building contractor who works out west, okay. and he was from here, New England. And he said, you know, I would never built a $7 million house. Right. He goes, but I have now. Right. And he goes, when I took the gig, <laughs> I just true. said, I'll figure it out. Right. And that positive mindset will yeah. get you through quite a lot. It just really being will. like, I will figure it out. That's it's okay. That's a great example. And, you, and you, you'll make mistakes, too. Right. But you know what? You're going to make mistakes no matter what. So... Yeah, and you learn from each one. Right. I used to have engraved on something I used to carry with me all the time, and it said, failure is the greatest success. Yeah. Because you learn from every failure you have, you learn from that. And if you believe that, if you honestly believe that, it makes life a lot yeah, easier, It really too, you know? definitely does. And I've made plenty of mistakes. So, And, and because of that, I've learned a lot, too. Right. And, and you've grown the Moore Center quite a bit. Yeah, it has grown a lot. So the Moore Center was created 55 years ago. Right. So halfway through, you took over. Right. 
when was there was a final law passed it was like 81 or 3 that right. really helped the Moore Center get more funding I right. believe right it, it was it was sort of what set New Hampshire apart from the rest of the country and New Hampshire was the first state in the entire country to close its institution uh, that served children and adults with developmental or intellectual disabilities and they created because they closed the institution that yeah. that happened over several years and as they were closing it they were creating an alternative system which is a community based system which is so much better for the individuals that we serve but so much less expensive too so it was a win win oh, wow. so it's you're providing uh, community based care and you're doing it for less than it costs to run the institution so i mean if you think of institutions like who would want to who would choose to live in an institution now is this like Nobody. dorm style yeah, it was, almost prison esque living it was it, the Lilconi state school really i mean there have been books written about it and uh, documentaries about it and it was not a good place to be and i think it was I mean, there, I think that the whole country and probably the whole world um, has, has seen institutional care as better than no care. And so that became the building block. And that was the first thing that got put into place. And yes, that was better than not taking care of anybody. Right. Um, but then once you saw the, the downside of institutional care um, and how poor the conditions were and how poor the treatment was, um, then you began to ask yourself, well, what now? What can we do now? And, and the what now for New Hampshire led them to create community-based care, which is flourishing and doing so well. And, um, and there's always going to be a few people because of the severity of their disability or because they're, they're medically fragile that, that living in the community without a lot of supports is, is not going to be the most effective way or even right. the, the best choice. But, but all things considered, most people do not need to be in institutions. And what's interesting about that is that that is true. When you think of the, the whole process of getting older, Mm -hmm. Sort of like the last stop for people is nursing home care, right? And that's right. an institution. And most people that end up in nursing homes and and know and we that we definitely need nursing homes, and it's the perfect place for some people. But lots of people end up in nursing homes because the the community care is just not there. And if you can right. provide, um, and that's what got more center uh, engaged in providing services to elderly people too, which was. Relatively oh, I'm very sorry new. About that. No, that's fine. Um, it's it's elderly care was something that we started in conjunction with the state yep. um, and the commissioner um, and the commissioner John Stevens at the time said, "You guys are doing a really good job doing community based care for people with intellectual disabilities. Could you do that for elderly people and keep them out of nursing homes?" And so we that's started amazing. that, and it that's beginning to flourish too because. I mean, some people would choose to go into a nursing home, but most people, you ask, do you want to go into a nursing home? Right. And the answer is no, I'd rather stay home. I think the people that choose to go into a nursing home um, have either committed to the fact that it's, it's too difficult for them to take care of themselves, right. or they have enough funding so that they can actually go to a nursing home that's not really a nursing home. It's more right. of one of those livable communities. Right, the assisted living. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, that's a completely different um, scenario and, right. and ideal. It's, it's almost one of the hallmarks of, of our system um, is, is the, it's giving people the ability to choose what is right for them, what works for them, what right. do they want. Instead of the world deciding what's right for them, let people decide and, and let people's families decide what's right for their in their family member or what's right for their family. And that's sort of the hallmark of how the Moore Center and all the other area agencies, and that's sort of the state's approach and philosophy is let families be an important right. you know, vote in determining what we do next. Yeah, because you know, my cousin Michael, who's now gone, um, had a, a disability, mm -hmm. but he was otherwise, you know, I think, if his parents hadn't been so protective of him, because when he did pass, which was recently, he was, I think, 55, mm -hmm. or um, at least in his, his early 50s, um, I think he might have ended up in an institution. But the thing was, is he was capable of living a relatively right. normal life. And I think that they just, that there are a lot of people that ended up in institutions that otherwise, with a little coaching and help from, right. like, the Moore Center, right. can easily be a very successful part of society. Right. And that 
he felt he worked at the Moore Center as a cleaner. Mm-hmm. It gave him so much pride yeah. to, to help. Yep. It really did. Yeah, everyone wants to feel like they're needed and, and have a purpose in their life. And yeah. um, it, it, so I think the, the so if you focus on on knowing that you're making those kinds of things happen for people, it's a very exciting and rewarding and it's it's a feel good place to work. And yeah. I think that's what I think if you talk to people that work at the Moore Center, they would say that they they are there because they believe that that the mission of the Moore Center is important, and they're there because they like being surrounded by other people who are doing that kind of work. Right, uh, it's like exciting. a family. Yeah, it really is true. And did you guys grow a lot in the '90s to the early 2000s? We have. When I that? when I got to the Moore Center, uh, the and incidentally, this is a perfect time for me to sort of offer a, a shout out to Bev Errol, who founded the organization, who has since passed away. But she was a mother with. Uh, children that had disabilities and there were no services and this was before the whole um, closing of the state school and um, the development of community-based care and she sat around with a small group of people on her kitchen table um, and started the Moore Center. Wow. Um, And when she retired it was a 20 million dollar company. Wow. Um, and so I, I um, when I first got to the Moore Center, I called Beverly because I love telling that story because it's true about the kitchen table. And I said, whatever happened to your kitchen table? And she goes, it's right here. I said, could we have it um, and put it in our lobby? And she goes, yeah, come and get it because that way I could get a new kitchen table. <laughs> and so we went to her house that afternoon, got her kitchen table and put it in the lobby at the Moore Center with a, a picture of her and honoring the work that, I mean, it's pretty incredible when you're thinking Think about it's uh, unbelievable. A, a, a single um, person having that kind of an impact. And so she, what she started has changed the lives of thousands and thousands of people. And so when she left, Bev and I knew each other because the Moore Center and Easter Sills worked closely together um, when, when I was there. Um, and so we knew each other. And so it was a really smooth and nice transition. So I'm only the second CEO that that, that organization has had. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so I, uh, uh, you know, I always want to remind people uh, that it started with just a small group of parents yep. and um, Bev saying, what can we do? And, and they had to change a lot of people's opinions. They really did. They including had, the state. Uh, yeah, the laws. absolutely. I mean, they're amazing. That, and so now the Moore Center is, uh, I think this year we're about a $60 million budget. We employ about wow. 500 people. Um, and so it continues to grow. And right now we're expanding our elderly services into other parts of the state um, because the need is there and because uh, we can. Right, so, that's amazing. Yeah, so we're very excited about that. You know, and I think my grandfather lived so far up in the northern part of New Hampshire, but that would have been great for him mm-hmm. uh, because he refused to move. Yep. Uh, but he also refused to take food delivery because he thought microwaves were evil. Yeah. I so, <laughs> so those so are he, some things you have yeah. to work around sometimes. So that's why he ended up in the nursing home, yep. even though he didn't particularly want to. Yep. Um, but he ended up liking it. He, he, the three square meals. Yeah. I don't know about the rest of it. Yeah, and and, like, and, and nursing home care is is great for some people. It's just right. um, I I think he would have rather have stayed home. Though. Yeah, you know if some if there was a system out there for him that wasn't uh, wildly expensive, I think he would have stayed home. Or and maybe you know if he didn't trust the people that were bringing in the food, or just maybe someone that could have acted as the middle person to help him right. make that go more smoothly. It's just having creative people solving problems that are really solvable. Right. But if you don't have people doing that, then things just seem to default to uh, a less desirable outcome. That's true. And if most people don't know the Moore Center, I mean, you guys started with, with helping people who have um, mental disabilities yep. that have um, acquired brain injuries. Yep, that's and true. And so that's what, post a accident? Yep. And also, um, and, and really... Um, uh, the biggest group, uh, we, we do definitely serve people with acquired, acquired brain disorders, but the biggest group of people is, are people with intellectual disabilities. And okay. so um, and so it's, and we have a great partnership with the state of New Hampshire. It, it, I mean, partnerships always have pluses and minuses, and I'm sure right, if you were right. talking to the state, they could think of a few pluses and minuses. Um, but all in all, it's worked really, really well. Um, and, and we've had a governor that has has really championed, I think, making sure that the wait list is funded yep. so that people don't have to wait for services and things. I just feel like there's a there's a shared commitment to do the best that we can for the people that we serve. And, and that's the beauty of working in a state as small as New Hampshire. 
that's, I mean, it, there is be our a bureaucracy, but it's everything is relative, and our bureaucracy, we find ways to work around it and through it, and, and together we make some wonderful things happen. Well, and it seems easier in New Hampshire to reach the top, you it know, really maybe does. in a larger yeah. state with tens of millions of people. How are you going to get to the to the governor? Yeah. But uh, in New Hampshire, you know, <laughs> The governor <laughs> actually, <laughs> he stopped in one afternoon. He was just in town and oh, great. said, hey, Paul. Uh, got a few minutes and he just came in and sat in my office and chatted for a while so just uh, hearing about things that we were doing and things that we needed his help so I mean that doesn't happen in other states I don't think no because it would be too much to stop at every charity right. even the good ones right. even the big ones because it would just take too much of their right. but in New Hampshire it's wonderful right that's true and uh, I mean so you help people from early early age right. correct all the way now to elderly yes um, that's amazing it's it's fun too. It's it's sort of like, as I'm growing older, I'm we're, I'm enjoying serving older people too. So it's um, oh, that's true. You know, yeah. yeah, you get to see it all come together. Absolutely. I mean, that's really amazing. And so, what's your favorite? So, what are some of the things that you really love that you've implemented that kind of help that the Moore Center does? I think that um, one of the things that that I feel proudest about is is create a work culture that. Um, it, it, recognizes how important our employees are because without our employees we're we're not able to provide good services and so the they're really um, the people that work for the Moore Center are really the backbone of the Moore Center and so I think we um, we're certainly not perfect in that regard but we recognize how important uh, the people that provide the care are mm -hmm. and I feel like I've really um, done my best and continue to to tr try to do as much as I can to make the more center a place where people want to be and right. where people want to work and so because that translates into positive care for the people that we serve and yep. so if you have good people working for you then your ability to provide good services is absolutely enhanced so I feel good about that I feel good about uh, one of the questions you had asked earlier about my own career and having had opportunities I think an organization that creates opportunities for people uh, to to grow, to, to grow and have a career within an organization is important so so we try to pay attention to those things and the people that um, rise to the top again are the people who sort of show up in a in a positive way who right. who say you know I can do that or I'd like to learn more about that or uh, who are just there to participate right. in the problem solving and we have a lot of really talented wonderful people that work at the agency That's and I'm, very, I'm very proud of that so um, how many people are you serving now we, we're serving about it's it's a that's a really inter interesting question because we serve so many people in um, in very small but very important ways. We have a right. family support system that uh, their motto is whatever it takes, and it's like they're helping people um, just dealing with the day-to-day -day realities of having somebody that they're taking care of at home in just little ways, but they make a huge difference. Right. For example, if you're having um, trouble paying your rent bill or your fuel bill, for example, and this, the wing of the Moore Center, the family support um, system, can provide a little support to help a family through that rough moment, then you've definitely changed that person's uh, life in a, in a very significant way. So, um, so it's, it's the little ways that we help people, and then we have people that, are, that we're caring for 24-7 that are in residential programs, that are in our day program. Yep. Um, many of them, uh, in our day pro and it's all community-based care, so they're working in the community, they're living in the community. When I got to the Moore Center, we had 27, I think, group homes, and that's with three or four people living in them, and now we're down to three, and that's for people who have really um, more complex needs. Yep. And we've transitioned all of those people into enhanced home care, which is living with a family, which is just more regular, more normal. You're not living in a house where you've got a staff coming in every eight hours, a different shift of people coming in. But you you have a normal life like everybody else. You you know do chores and you go to the movies and yeah. you you just live a, a normal life. And um, so I think that's amazing. It, it, I, I'm very excited about those things um, because I'm always saying, 
you know, what would I want for myself? What would I want for my kids? What would I want for my family? And then I try to, to do the best that I can, and we try to do the best that we can to make sure we're replicating that in our organization. I mean, I think you really are. I mean, it's unbelievable to, to go from 27 homes to right. three right. and finding places in the community for all of these people who right. are otherwise there right. um, and normalizing their lives. I mean, that was the biggest thing with my cousin was we just normalized his life right. as much as we could. Right. And that's, interestingly enough, the program with our elderly services that's the most successful right now. It's called Kinship Care. Mm -hmm. And the state allows us to pay family members to take care of their relatives in their home. So. Oh, it's sort of, burden. it really is because it, there's a lot of people that would gladly take care of their grandmother, but they can't afford to because they have to work. So right. if you can give them a stipend, which allows them to make ends meet, and then they can stay home and take care of their grandmother, um, everybody wins with that kind of a situation. That changes people's lives. And That's the cost of, of, of giving someone a stipend to take care of a, a relative versus the cost of putting them into the nursing home, it's like, Totally, there's no comparison. Right. So it just makes it makes good sense from a from a funding standpoint, but it makes really good sense from a, from a heart standpoint and from a quality of care and quality of life standpoint. Yeah, and I really have to you know shout out my dad when um, you know when my cousin's parents passed away. My dad completely took over and became the sole person who cared for Michael. Wow. And even while working full time here at the store, I mean, did Michael was able to live on his own, thankfully, and had mm -hmm. a small apartment. Um, but my dad dedicated a lot of his time and energy to making sure that on top of his family that Michael right. was okay. You, you know, know it's a, that's, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because it's the, the families, our system works because we have really strong families um, who are there for their family member and who are um, sort of putting our feet to the fire in terms of making sure that they're getting the best that they can for their family member. Um, but also they say very engaged and very involved. And so it's a, it's a collaboration and, and right. those kinds of things always work better. And I wish the whole world could work like that. So that everyone too, sort of works together to have as good an outcome as you can possibly have. For the greater good. Right. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully. So, right. It's a good, you know, it's, it's positivity, right? Absolutely. Which is the main focus of your first book, right? Begin right. with Yes. Yeah. It's like, it, it's interesting. I Before I wrote the book, I had the title um, because I just liked it. I thought it sounded good. And I always thought Yes was the most um, important part of that title because it's positive and it's it's affirming and um, it sort of speaks to having a positive attitude. But someone pointed out to me, and I think it's true, that the word begin is as important, if not more important, and it gets back to doing something. Right. And um, there are so many times when we're, we feel stuck, and I feel like I just wrote a, a blog for another publication the other day just talking about, don't think because I write self-help books that I've figured everything out. I'm, right. le I'm still learning as I'm going, and half of the stuff I write is for me because I need to hear it myself. But it's, um, it's, we've all felt like stuck. Right. Um, and the, the, the secret to moving past getting stuck is to do something. And sometimes it's, it's not necessarily focused on your goal Right. But it's just doing something, getting up, going for a walk, cleaning out a closet, um, baking a cake, right. doing something, get moving. And if once you're moving, the, the truth of the matter is if you're moving, you're not stuck. You can't be moving and stuck at the same time. And that right. sometimes liberates you to begin then get sort of a refreshed visit back to what the challenges are. And you, you get there with a more open, uh, optimistic, hopeful attitude, and you begin to say, well, what's, it's not like, how can I solve this problem? Uh, that, I think, is the question. The question is, what's one small thing I can do to move myself in the right direction? And you right. can always find one small thing. I, always. I, I believe in small and huge goals. Yep. And you know, I was just reading about a... Um, a famous actor today who I think he said he was 350 pounds at his heaviest. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's amazing because they said, how did you start? I mean, he's now, he's almost like five, uh, ten percent body fat or something. Wow. He's very thin. Um, and he said, you know what? I just started walking right. and then I started setting a goal of 10,000 steps. And if I didn't hit the 10,000 steps, I would walk around my living room. Yeah. That, that's that, that, right. that perfect little, like one step 
turned him into now focusing heavily on his health. Do you have time for a real quick story? Absolutely. Okay, because th this was a woman who I've never met. She lives in Oklahoma, but I had spoken to a um, book club about Begin With Yes. This goes back several years ago. And someone in that group sent a copy of a book to a friend of hers that lived in Oklahoma who was waiting for an organ transplant. Um, and she had been waiting for a long time. She was pretty ill and she was basically bedridden and she realized that even if they did find a donor that yeah. her health would not be um, strong enough that they would probably do the operation and give her the, the transplant right. and so she read the book and I'm not saying that this book uh, uh, and but maybe I should say this book did change her life because she read the book and she got the next day instead of staying in bed she got out of bed and brushed her teeth really um, and then each day she pushed it a little bit further and and then several weeks later she was standing on her front steps Wow um, and she just got stronger and stronger um, and then maybe a year and a half or two years later I'm not a hundred percent sure on the time but she started an SD business online wow. um, and she was selling things, and she was much healthier, and she was out and about, and she stopped at a restaurant, was telling a server who she did not know um, her story, and that server offered her a, an organ to be transplanted, and it, she got the organ transplant, and she's thriving now from wow. a total stranger. That's amazing. Um, and it started with her getting out of bed and brushing her teeth. That's unbelievable. Yeah, so it gives me chills telling that story, and it's 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 absolutely, literally, factually true. It really is. That's unbelievable. Yeah. That's at, you know that those are the stories that people should look at right. and be like, that's the true meaning of anything is possible because right. it's just like little steps right. lead to really make. Because I'm sure a lot of those first few weeks were really hard. They definitely were, and she had. You, you don't always have a guarantee that how it's going to work out. Right. And she certainly wasn't intending to meet a um, a server in a restaurant um, that would give her an organ. Don't right. You? An organ, so it's um, an incredible story, and I think it gives those kinds of stories. I think we need to tell, and we need to share, and people need to hear them because if this woman can do it, right, it's like you can do it too. And and I think people need to hear that more often. There's so much negativity. Yep. I mean, just constant. We in in our house, we don't even really watch the news anymore because the negativity it's so much that right. you're not getting anything from watching the news. All you're seeing is just tons and tons right. of negativity. So mm -hmm. being positive is huge. It really is. And staying in that mindset, not letting it get to you, is really amazing. And 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 deciding who you're going to spend time with. It's like I when I first wrote the book, I said, boy, if you if you've got someone really negative in your life, just sort of move away from them and then the woman that was editing the book said well what if it's your your mother or <laughs> it's your husband or your wife or, or whatever and I realized that I was giving a, a, an overly simplistic answer but it's so I, I revised that part of my book to say well if you can't get rid of the negative people in your life bring more positive people in to offset the negativity right and um, I think that that's you know that's our responsibility it's sort of like we can sit there feeling depressed or we can call somebody and go for a walk with them and just see how they're doing right. check in on somebody right and that's a really key point it's like usually what you're finding that you need you actually have the capacity to give that to somebody else so here's an example if you're feeling lonely you actually have the power and the capacity to reach out and make somebody else less lonely. And if you do that, you're less lonely too. Right. So when you're sitting at home one, thinking about what it is that you need, turn that into what do I have that I could offer somebody else? Um, and again, it just shifts your mindset. Right. Rather moving. than you just staying home and being lonely, you'd be like, you know what? I have three friends I haven't seen right. in, in three months. Right. I or, need to, let's, let's right. Or, or my aunt in the nursing home probably hasn't had anyone visit her for two weeks or two months or two years. And go do that. And yeah. again, it's the begin. It's the doing something. And then you begin to feel things shift. And when you feel things shift, you begin to feel, wow, I'm feeling a little bit better. Maybe I can um, brush my teeth and uh, put a load of clothes in the, in the washing machine. Right. That's amazing. And so you wrote a new book with all right. this right. new I, knowledge? I, yeah, I think that 
Um, in between, like Be Amazing, um, Begin With Yes first came out 10 years ago, and in between that, I've written several other books. Um, but I really, but they were along that same theme, sort of promoting the same kinds of messages. And I sort of had this, this sort of turning point for me. Um, and I have to give um, Business New Hampshire Magazine credit for this because they hired me to, to do a, uh, a, a presentation uh, at one of their events. Um, because Heidi, the publisher, knew that I was halfway through writing this book called Be Amazing, but it wasn't done. So that sort of pushed me into getting it further along. But I, I sort of realized that and, and believe in my heart that everybody has the capacity to be amazing um, in, a, in a variety of ways. And, and I've tried to um, simplify how you go from where you are to what you would like to be or feel about yourself and I think it's it's the kind of book that's for everybody because it you might want to be an amazing friend or an amazing CEO or an amazing pharmacist or an amazing grandfather um, all you have to do is is pick what it is that you want to be amazing at and then you begin to say well what would that look like what does an amazing grandfather look like right and and for me that's one of the things I want to be amazing at so I, I asked myself what does that look like and it, it says that's about remembering to call your grandchildren remembering to what their favorite candy bar is remembering what their interests are and maybe picking up a book my grandchildren all live far away so I have to do this a lot by um, FaceTime and mail and, and telephone calls but it's like if you can identify what amazing what an amazing grandfather looks like and it's not that complicated right and then you say well then I'm going to start doing those things and then you're, you're beginning now it's a more deliberate it's a more conscious um, approach to be becoming what you want to be um, and so if you want to be an amazing grandfather that's a little bit easier than being an amazing pharmacist but it, right. the principles are the same and so I began thinking about that and 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 writing about that and that's how the book be amazing came about um, and if Heidi hadn't invited me to to speak to this group of people about be amazing um, I'm not sure if I if it would be done yet so thank you Heidi for <laughs> well then this is perfect because she's also the one that allowed us to have this podcast so okay, she really great. is amazing so it comes full circle it does so. it comes full circle that's unbelievable <laughs> so we both thank you Heidi yes. and I, I think that that's so important because I really do think that more people should should feel that way that you know, no matter what's going on in your life at that moment, that you can still beat whatever it is. Right. Um, whether it's losing a job or a relationship or something like that, uh, you can find the power within yourself to be whatever you want it to be. Right. No matter how late, uh, you know, in life it really is. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people now that I, I feel like this was fewer um, in years past where, you know, they're hitting 30 and they're changing, fully changing careers, right. going back to school, saying... Right. I made a mistake. Right. I'm going, and this is not, I cannot see myself doing this for another 30 years. I need to go back right. and change my life. And, and I think that's amazing. It's I like, think they should read this book. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> yeah. so. And it's, it's, I think Be Amazing is a great name. I think that that's wonderful. And I really think that if they start with Begin With Yes and then re read Be Amazing, that right. it would really help some, a lot of people really confirm what they're trying to do and, and trying to be successful in whatever it is. You're, you're right. So they do go hand in hand. And I, I think what I'm excited about to be amazing, it feels like it's a progression for me in, in terms of, of how this whole thing has developed. And it's fun for me to, to see that. Um, I go back and, and read Begin With Yes, and I feel like it needed the be amazing piece too. So it, it, yeah, it sounds like at the, the you know once you read the begin with yes, then you go to be amazing. And yeah. You're like it just re keeps you reaffirming right. everything you're supposed you have supposed to have learned from begin with yes. Right. And I mean, you also have it's 2.1 million Facebook right. followers. Yeah, that's been exciting. And and they follow you for your your amazing quotes, right? And and just your constant right. positivity. Right. And ag again, it's I think it's I think that is that honestly is how I got an agent and a, a book publisher interested is because I had this platform of people and they're literally from all over the world and it's the most engaged audience. It's like I do a post on the page and it's not unusual for a thousand people to, to like and, and share it. And that's how the page has grown. That's amazing. Um, and so now I, I run into people all the time, really, um, who know me through the, the Facebook page because if you think of how much potential reach so that's two million people 
who are on Facebook and they all have three or four hundred friends. Right. Or three or five, three or four thousand friends. They share if if even a small percentage of those people share, my reach is huge. It's way, way beyond the two million. That's just the base. Right. And so then that and it's like I, I hear from people who said, oh, my aunt in Ireland just sent me your begin with yes quote and not realizing the, the friendship connection or um, it's just because people are sharing it. And, you're, and to back to your point, it's like I think people are hungry for a little bit of, of light in, in the darkness and a little bit of positivity when we're surrounded by so much negative. All I, the, I think they really are. Yeah. And I think that's the most amazing part about not only your books but your Facebook page that it's not – just for attention this right. you're honestly helping people who you must on a daily basis catch someone in an awful mood right. sees your post they sit they they think about that for two or three minutes and they go i'm not going to let the, whatever this thing right. is today i'm moving on from it right if i had a dollar for everyone that said are you reading my mind this is exactly what i needed to hear today um and honestly it's because that's what i needed to hear too and i think that there's there's something um, I think that authenticity that you feel on the page, and it's not a um, somebody. It's not somebody that has this special wealth of knowledge. It's just a human community of people helping each other. And um, if you haven't visited the page, I hope people will go to the page because someone will do a post, and then. 15 other people will respond to that person's post and say, oh, you know, I had the exact same experience and I'm feeling the same way you are. And then all of a sudden, the sense of community is blossoming. I mean, just knowing someone else is feeling right. nervous makes you feel better, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's just, it's fun to see. And it's, at the beginning, I tried to keep up with every single comment. Um, but it, it far exceeded my ability I'm sure to it's do. Too far now. It's, but um, I, I do think of the people on that page as, as family, and I, I, it sounds ridiculous, but I'm sincere in that. I really care about the, the people there, right. and I think they care about me. And what a gift! Yeah, I mean, you've created a, a beautiful, amazing community of mm. people that are apparently, which I didn't know, are even helping each other yeah. beyond just you helping right. them. And so if anybody wants to find that, that's Facebook uh, at Begin With Yes. Right. And if you go on there, I mean, it's, it's, it's motivating. I mean, just the quotes alone. Sure. And then I, the community is unbelievable. It really is. So. And I appreciate you coming on. This was really, really fun. Wow. It was great to learn about you and about your books. And everybody go out and buy Begin With Yes and then buy <laughs> Be Amazing, the newest book. And uh, hopefully those things help you out. Well, thank you very much. It's been so much fun chatting with you. And when we sat down, I had no idea what we were going to talk about. So that's the beauty of uh, communication, right? And connecting with people. Isn't it fun? Yeah, it yeah, really these fun is. conversations, yep. just learning. I amazing. feel better for having spent uh, a little bit of time with you. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, everybody, you can find us on uh, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, iTunes, and Castbox. And we want to thank our sponsors again, uh, New Hampshire Business Magazine, for uh, allowing us to do this podcast. Have a great day. <laughs>